there comes a point in every maker's journey when they decide to make something they don't strictly need. Whether it's out of curiosity to see if the idea will work, or because you just want to make some interesting parts. In the case of this project, it's both. Currently I use my lathe's tailstock as a centerline reference for setting the cutting tool heights. While this has been an acceptable method so far, it's not very convenient and also not very accurate. The common solution to this is to use a simple reference bar to compare the tool heights to, like this one you just watched me make. This works fine of course, it's just not all that exciting. A much cooler way would be to position an indicator right at the tool's tip, which would give me both accuracy and convenience. Of course I'd need a way to hold it in the right position, and a way to set a reference zero point, and it would be really cool if it had magnets. So I'm going to see what I can come up with. Strictly speaking, I don't need this tool. There are other ways to set a cutting tool's height. I could just use a simple bar like I already showed, or I could even use a surface gauge I spent a month on last year to do exactly this kind of thing. Of course I would have to spend a bit of time setting it up as well as address some reach issues for certain tools, but I can make do. While both of these options would work in a pinch, simply put, I don't wanna. What good is a machine shop if I can't use it to make an overcomplicated version of something I don't technically need? And besides, having a dedicated tool that is ready to go at any time has an elegance and cool factor that I can't really resist. So, let's make a tool height indicator. It will need a base that holds a vertical rod, and that rod will provide the mounting spot for an indicator clamp. The base will be narrow enough to fit on the lathe's ways, which are both flat and accessible for any length tool I might mount. I don't want to permanently attach a dial indicator to this tool though, so I'll need to include a reference point of some sort. This will be adjusted to the lathe centerline height ahead of time, then I can just swing it under the indicator anytime I need to re-zero it. And to bring the excitement level way up, I'll include some magnets in the base so that it sticks to the ways. That's the general idea sorted out, time to make it machinable. Which means I need some drawings. I'll start on the base. For all intents and purposes, this could just be a rectangular block with holes in it. But the general theme of this project is making something I don't strictly need, so I'm going to spice it up a bit. I'll include a sort of relief on the top to add some interest here, as well as some rounds on the ends. To mount the magnets, I'll include some blind holes so that I can fully enclose them with a plug from the top. This will not only make for a streamlined look, but also make cleaning the surfaces from iron chips so much easier. Last is a rod mounting feature where I'll use my favorite slit clamp design with three counterboard screws. The indicator clamp also includes two more slit clamp features, one to hold the indicator and one to hold it to the rod. But I'll include a counterboard screw hole on the rod side since this is more of a fixed joint, and the indicator side will just have a clearance hole for a thumb screw. For the thumb screw itself I'll go with my usual two piece design a knurled brass knob that gets press fit onto a threaded steel stud. Even though part of me finds it boring to duplicate this again, I really just like the way it looks, so it stays. The mounting rod is pretty straightforward, with just a slight dome on the end. And to save a lot of tedious work on this part, I treated myself a little and bought a precision ground rod of 4140 for the job. The last thing I need is a height reference flag for zeroing the indicator. I could keep this simple and just make a rectangular block with a hole in it, but by now I'm sure you know my feelings about that. Instead, I'll make an eccentrically mounted disc with a tube stem for additional stability. This will perform the same function, but will be way more interesting to make. To support the flag at the right height, I'll make, you guessed it, another slit clamp. But I'll mix it up yet again on this one and make it eccentric to match the style of the flag. Alright, I've got all my dimensions and details sorted out. Time for the fun part. I think I'll start at the bottom and work my way up. First is the base. I've decided to make it from aluminum, which is essentially magnetically transparent. So the magnets will have a stronger holding force than if I just embedded them in a block of steel. There's a little more to it than that, but it's a bit of a rabbit hole that I might save for another time. So for now, let's just get this block squared up. I'll start by fly cutting the faces flat. 
except that surface finish looks pretty janky. Ah, chipped insert. Let me get this flipped around. Are you kidding me? My grandfather always said I over tighten things, but looking at the character of this steel, I think this was bound to happen. Luckily I have a backup fly cutter, so I'll get this one set up and I can finish the job. Now that's more like it. I'll square up the other three sides, mill the ends down the length, and then we can start on the more interesting stuff. I'll start by spot drilling for the three holes I'll need to add here. But before I move on to actually drilling them, I'll use these points to help scribe the rounds I want to add to the ends. Except I don't really like the way that looks now. Change of plans. Maybe a larger radius. Nope, not liking that either. One more try. This time I'll go somewhere in between. Okay, I like that. I don't know why, but that just looks more refined to me. So I'm going to go with it. Back to the holes. The first will be for the main post that everything mounts to. This needs to be both a close fit on the diameter and also very square to the base so that I don't have any errors to contend with later. Reaming the hole to dimension would take care of the fit, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee squareness since it follows the hole that I just drilled and that could have wandered off vertical, especially on a deep hole like this. So instead I'll use a tool that cuts its own path, the boring head. This will be a bit tricky though since this is my smallest cutter. It's just small enough to cut the bore I need, but still too big to fit in the starting hole I drilled. So I'm taking special care not to overshoot the diameter on my first pass. So much for sneaking up on it, I'm already at dimension. No doubt this was a result of pure luck and nothing to do with any skill of my own. Because that was just way too close for comfort. Either way, the shaft fits and I can move on to the magnet holes. First is to drill them a bit undersized, and also stopping just shy of the 1.5 inch thickness. Then I can bring in an end mill to finish the job. This will open up the diameter to match the magnets, but also leave a square profile at the bottom allowing the magnets to sit closer to the surface. Doesn't get any better than that. Before I install these though, I still have some other stuff I want to knock out. First is to form the rounds on the ends. I'll mask the bottom surface just to avoid scratching it all up, then work my way to the scribe lines on the belt grinder. This doesn't leave a very pretty surface though, so I'll spend a little time manually finishing these with a higher grade grinding paper. That's much better. Now let's move on to the magnets. I should probably see how these will work though before I permanently mount these in here. So first a test. Oh yeah, that's definitely strong enough. It feels really stable, but it's not so much so that I can't overcome it by hand. Just how I need it to be. Now to get these in here permanently. My idea is to make a couple of aluminum plugs that will press fit in. Then when I do the final milling, they should disappear without a trace. But as luck would have it, I don't have any aluminum round stock in the neighborhood of the diameter I need, and it seems like a waste to turn down something that's almost four times the size. So instead I'll take a more interesting approach and make my own rod from this leftover square stock the base was cut from. I'll get a manageable piece cut down on the bandsaw, then scribe and center drill the end before moving over to the lathe. I can use a four jaw chuck to grab onto the four sides of the material and then use a live center to support the end. To get it aligned, I'll sweep an indicator across the flat faces of the stock and make any adjustments with the chalk to get it close to true. Then I just turn down the diameter until it's two thou larger than the holes in the base for a nice press fit. I'll part two of these off and also remount each and file a slight lead in on the ends to help with assembly. All right, no turning back. Time to conceal the magnets forever. Well, that went mostly okay, but there was one small hiccup. I completely neglected the fact that I trapped air in the magnet holes. 
Now I have a couple bumps on the bottom as a result of that extremely highly compressed air. Probably would have been wise to ever so slightly file a flat on the sides of the plugs to give the air a way to escape. Fortunately, the bumps go away with a little bit of work on an India stone. The last task to truly hide these magnets for good is to mill the top face. But I appear to have gotten ahead of myself once again. Because I already rounded the ends of the base, I back myself into a corner and now have no secure way to hold this in the vise. I might be able to really gronk down on the vise to hold it steady, but then I risk marring all the fine finishing work I just did on the ends. Fortunately in machining there's usually more than one way to skin a cat. So I'll mount this directly to the table. A couple of step clamps will hold the base both flat and secure, and I can use a dial indicator to tram the part square to the mill. Because I already ground the ends of the part, I can't really rely on them as a reference anymore. So instead I'll insert the rod into the precision bore I made earlier and zero on this. Then after all that's set up I can start milling. First removing the excess plug length, then working my way deeper to form the feature. Alright, that looks pretty good. And just like I wanted, you can't even tell there are plugs here. Now for the final task of making the clamping slit. I'll start with the holes, and since these are on a curved surface, I'll first spot face the locations flat with an end mill. Then I can move on to drilling the pre-tap and clearance holes. I'll counterbore these just deep enough to clear the socket head screws, tap each of the holes, and lastly split the joint with a slitting saw. Now for a test. Oh yeah, no problem here. I've barely tightened the screws and they have plenty of holding power. This is going to work just fine. Alright, that's part one of seven in the bag. I feel like I've got my mill mojo going, so I think I'll whip up the indicator clamp next. Change of materials this time though, as this one is from A2 Tool Steel. After cutting the stock to size and milling a square starting point, I can cut my first and only real chamfers of the project. Sad I know, but I have a lot of other interesting features across the parts, so I think these will make up for the upsetting lack of chamfers. Laying the part on its side, I can then begin working on the clamping holes. These come right up near the back edge of the part, so to spare myself catastrophe, I'll remove the rear parallel bar. I'll spot drill the two hole locations before scribing the corner rounds, then drill and ream the two holes. I'll head to the belt grinder once again for the rounds, and then give these the manual touch. This always takes four times longer than the initial grinding process, but I think the results are worth the effort. Once again, the final task is to make the clamping slit in each end. The locations or the features are symmetrical, so I can save myself a little work by using a vice stop. This allows me to simply flip the part end for end as I move through similar operations. And just like that, part number two is ready to go. It locks perfectly on the rod side, it probably will on the indicator as well. Actually, let's go ahead and knock out the thumb screw I'll need here next. I actually walked through this exact process in a recent video, so just enjoy this machining montage. Despite having made this exact thumb screw twice now, I still managed to goof it up. The press fit knob isn't quite as tight as I need, so I'm going to use a little Loctite here and cross my fingers. This leaves the last bit of work of parting this off and turning the decorative hollow on the face after the Loctite has had time to set up. Alright, this is coming together nicely. It's actually starting to look like a thing. Heck, I could technically use this to do the job I need it to, but it'll be made a lot easier to use with these final parts. The height reference flag and the clamp. I've been really looking forward to making these parts, so this should be fun. I'll start with the flag. 
Since both of these parts will require some eccentric features, I'll be using the fore jaw. But before I get into that, I need to turn down the outside diameter. So I'll first adjust the stock true on the chuck, then face the end and bring the diameter down to dimension. This isn't a super high tolerance diameter, so within a thou or so is just fine. Now for the eccentric bits. I need to machine a bore and stem offset from the current center axis. So I'll use two of the chuck's jaws to shift the part right in this setup. The distance between the two center lines is 3 eighths of an inch. So using a dial indicator, I can adjust the offset until the min and max readings are twice that distance at 3 quarters. Then to verify the part is also straight in the chuck, I can sweep the indicator along the length. Perfect. Alright, time to make some chips. With how eccentric this is, I'll be contending with a pretty severe interrupted cut basically the whole way. So to make this go a little more smoothly, I'm going to swap this current insert for one with a big honking nose radius. This will make the chip formation more gradual, which will be a lot less hard on the insert, the part, and the machine. Alright, let's give it a go. Oh yeah, this insert just eats it up. 100 thou cut depths are a breeze. Which is a good thing because I have a long way to go. But it sure is mesmerizing watching something solid form right out of this ghostly whirl. Before too long, I'm already down the cutting continuously within the material, but I'm not going to take it all the way to dimension just yet. I still have the bore to do, and with how much material is being removed, I want to minimize the risk of internal stresses warping this part. So I'll go ahead and drill the undersized starting hole, then bring in my smallest boring bar to open it up the last 15 thou. I did end up screwing up the beginning of the bore a bit while I was sorting out tool clearances, but further in there's a nice smooth surface, and it's an absolutely perfect fit for the rod, so I'm not too upset about it. Now I can move back to the outside using a form tool to finish the stem diameter and length, while putting a nice eighth inch fillet in the corner. And of course I can't resist polishing up these surfaces with emery cloth before parting it off. This just leaves the final job of facing the top side. It's important that this be as square as possible to the stem bore, so I'm using a collet chuck to grab it by the stem. There is the potential that this could be ever so slightly off square because of the inherent nature of a 5C collet to grip mostly at the tip. But if that issue presents itself, I can always reface this part another way. Alright, after a cleanup on this side as well, the flag is finished. This just leaves one last and final part to make. The clamp to hold the flag in place. So it's back to the four jaw chuck for some more eccentric fun. I'll start off like before though, by first turning down a concentric OD and also breaking the edge with a small chamfer. Once that's the size, I can bring the indicator back in and shift the part in the chuck the same way as the flag. Only this time the offset is much smaller at 3 16 of an inch. Once dialed in, I can drill and ream the hole. And after verifying the fit with the rod, I can part this off. I'll switch again to the collet chuck to finish the opposite side, as well as drop a matching chamfer on here. Then since this is the end of all the lathe work, polish all the faces. So far so good. Now to add the actual clamping features. These will be exactly the same as all the slit clamps from before with a counterboard screw hole and a parting slit. But the setup is a little tricky this time. I need a way to position this in the vise at the correct angle so that the parting slit is properly centered. It took a little figuring, but I realize I can again rely on the rod as a reference point for the part. I can rest the rod on the top surface of the vise, zero an indicator on the top of the rod, lower the mill's table the distance from the top of the rod to the top of the part when everything is square, then just adjust the part's angle until the indicator reads zero on the top face. And that should get it pretty bang on. Or at least close enough for this non-critical part. From here is the same process as the others, drilling, tapping, and slitting the clamping features. And just like that, the final part is complete. Time to put this all together and get it all set up. Oh wait, I almost forgot about the rod. My design only requires this to be 9 inches long, but I think I'll go ahead and leave it at the full 12. You never know when a little extra length could be useful. So all I really have to do is put a slight dome on the ends with the form tool and of course bring it to a shine. Okay, now everything is finished. And finally seeing all the different pieces together, I really like the way this turned out. 
The true test though will be how useful it actually is after a little setup. I first have to get the reference flag set to the correct spot. It needs to be exactly the same height that the center line of the lathe is from the ways where this mounts. But trying to measure this distance directly isn't exactly easy to do. So I'm not going to do that at all. Instead what I'll do is mount something of a known diameter in a collet chuck. In this case a half inch end mill shank. Then I'll mount the indicator on the lathe's cross slide and zero it on the diameter of the shank. Without adjusting the indicator arm, I'll bring the carriage over to where I can mount my new tool. Then just bring the flag up until my reading on the indicator is a quarter inch lower than the reading I got on the end mill shank. And then tighten the locking collar at that height. Now I have a reliable reference point that's ready to go anytime I place this on the lathe and mount a dial indicator for tool height setting. And it swings out of the way once I'm ready to measure. Actually, let's see where some of my tools have been hanging out. Looks like this one's about 10 thou high. And this one's more like 18 thou high. Not super far off, but could have been better. And I like better. So now with this tool, I can use it to dial in the heights exactly. And I think that's pretty cool. There are of course some tool geometries that I just won't be able to measure. But in those cases, I can just use the reference flag to set the height the traditional way. So I have options. Overall, I'm really pleased with this build. I started off with just an idea for an alternative tool height setting method. One that might be a little more interesting than the standard reference bar. And for the heck of it, I decided to include some more interesting features. Now I have a convenient, accurate, and reliable method for setting my tool heights, which will improve not only the quality of my work, but the experience of using this shop, even though I may not have strictly needed this in the first place. And as important with all my builds, it was fun to make. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time.